We're in the uh, eighth week, I guess, of our James series. We've been studying through the book of James, and we've learned a lot of practical things about how to live out our Christian uh, life. And one of the things that we're going to talk about today is how to invest it. And serving is one of the ways that we can invest in the kingdom and, and have an investment that is really going to count. Um, I think that whenever we start talking about the idea of investing, uh, so many times our mind goes to, you know, money, money. That's what we have to invest. And one of the things that we want to know about, we want to feel good about, is that it's a secure, secure investment, right? That's what we want to make sure that we don't put our investment somewhere where we're going to lose on it or it's not going to matter or that when we get to retirement age that the nest egg is gone and we don't have anything. And, and the Bible here, James is telling us about the same thing. He's, he's giving us some strategies uh, about how to invest our life. And if you think about the currency of life, what we really have to invest and what really matters, there's really only three things. God gives you time, the time that you have. He gives you the talent that you have, and he gives you the treasure that you have. And it's up to us to invest those things in the right way so that we can have a secure return on our investment. Everybody would say, hey, amen, that's what we're looking for. That's, that's what we want. Well, here in chapter 5 of, of, of the book of James, he highlights two strategies. He talks about two different things. He talks about two different types of investments and why one is working and why one is not working. And what we're going to try to do today is get down to, the, to what really matters and what we can invest our life in, how we can invest, and then we can know that we'll get a secure return on our investment. So I hope that sounds like something you're interested in. If it's not, just hang on anyway. We'll try to make you happy. Not really. Just kidding. So James is talking, talking about investing, and, and here's the thing that we all need to understand. We all need to understand this, is that whenever James is talking to us about how we should invest our lives and what we should do, it's in the light of this one thing, in the light of the fact that this life that we live, this, this, the air we breathe and the things that we can touch, all these things are temporary. All of the things that you're looking at, the chair that you're sitting in, the job that you have, the clothes that you're wearing, everything that you can see, taste, touch, feel, all of that is temporary and it's going away. And the other thing that he wants you to know is this. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, he is the reason that we're here. Jesus Christ died on a cross for our sins. Jesus Christ ascended into heaven. Jesus Christ made a promise that if I go to be with the Father, don't worry, I'm going to come back and I'm going to get you and you're going to be with me for eternity. So here's the other thing that James wants us to understand as we begin to invest our life and as we look at the things that are going to be most secure is to know this. The fact is that Jesus Christ, who died and was buried and resurrected, is going to come back. He's coming back. He's coming back. And I want you to get that. If, I, if you don't get anything else today, out of this passage of Scripture, if you don't understand, if nothing else sinks in, I want you to right now just pray. Father, open my heart and my mind to your word. Holy Spirit, change my heart. Move me in the direction that you want me to go. That's not too big of a prayer to pray, but it's a scary prayer to pray. Right? Because it could, I mean, it really could challenge your way of thinking. It really could challenge your way of living. If we opened up our heart and our mind to the movement of the Holy Spirit and to the truth of God's word, and we said, I will not ask the word to align itself with my principles or my ideals, but I am going to align myself with inerrant scripture. I'm going to align myself with God's will, and I'm going to invest my life according to scripture. I got one amen. I'm praying for the rest of you guys. <laughs> you sound a little bit worried. So here we go. Now, you remember James. This is the way James writes. James doesn't ease into things. Now, I don't know if you've noticed over the past eight weeks, but James comes at us and he says, here it is, black and white, this is what you need to do. I'm not going to sugarcoat it, I'm not going to, you know, take it easy on it, I'm not going to baby you along. He's going to just give it to us, you know. And sometimes it hurts, and most of the time, all the time, if we apply it, it's a blessing. So, here we go. He says this, James 5, 1 through 6, now listen, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming upon you. Your wealth 
has rotted, and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages that you fa failed to pay, the workmen who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fatted yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered innocent men who were not opposing you. James 5, 1 through 6. And so James takes this really difficult topic of wealth. You know the Bible talks more about money than any other topic any other time, more than love, more than forgiveness, the Bible talks about money. And I think that the Bible talks about money so much because we are so focused on it. It is such a trap in this life that we live that we, we uh, sometimes are identified by what we have, what we do, the jobs we have, the money we make, the car we drive, the clothes we wear, all those things. We put so much stock into that. I really believe that that's why the Bible is talking to us and reminding us that this is not all there is. And I don't know if you noticed in that passage, he said, look, he said, look, he said, the time of the end is near. He said, you're taking that money, though, the treasure that you have, and you're using it for the wrong thing. And I don't want anyone in this room to get the wrong idea. Wealth is not bad. You hear me? Wealth is not bad. I pray that all of you would be wealthy. I mean, it would be a great thing. If you were all wealthy and you all tithe, then we could win West Fort Worth to the Lord. Amen, right? So you would agree with that? One guy said yes. One person agrees with that. We're all wealthy, are we not? I mean, compared to the rest of the world, we are, we are wealthy people. I mean, we are blessed people. The fact that you have clothes on your back, shoes on your feet, you got to take a shower and a good hot shower this morning. You know, the Troop family just got back from their survey trip in Nigeria. They understand what poverty is about. We don't get it. We don't get it. We're a blessed nation. We're a blessed people. But so many times we take that, the idea that uh, money is so important that we invest our whole life getting money, storing money, saving money, and we get to the end. And let me tell you what, when you die, you know what you leave? You leave the money. It doesn't go with you. It doesn't last. Money is one of those things that God gives us to use. He gives us a tool to use. While we're here, it's called money. It's one of those things that we don't get to take with us. But now what we can do is invest that money in the right way, and we'll have eternal benefit from that. And that's what I think he wants to get across to us. And he's showing us all of the ways that it doesn't work. He said, look, you, you, you rich people, you need to be careful because you've really uh, based your identity on what you have and, and what you do and, and the, the money and the savings and the clothes. And he said, not only that, you've, you've not spent it for an eternal purpose, but you wasted it on self-indulgence. And, and you even came by it dishonestly. He said, you, you were so focused on that money, so focused on earning, so focused on being rich, so focused on yourself that you didn't even pay people that worked for you. And you took the money that you were supposed to pay them and you lived uh, high on the hog. You know, you, you, you spent it on yourself. You drove the best car. You wore the best clothes. And, and I want to tell you, there's nothing wrong with that, but that, if that's all you have, that's nothing. It's nothing. And that's what James is trying to get across to us. And, he, and I, I think that from that, we can draw some conclusions. Number one, that it is Better not to hoard, but not to hoard it greedily, but to manage it wisely. That's one thing he's telling us. He said, don't hoard it. Have you noticed I, some of the most generous people that I've ever seen in my life were wealthy people? There's a lot of times we say, man, people are rich, are greedy. They're greedy. That's how they got. They're greedy. But, you know, I've, I've met quite a few wealthy people, and you know what I found? Is that they're generous. Many, many times they're generous. Many, many, many times they give it away. And, you know, the, some of the people that are the greediest, the most tight-fisted, the ones that, you know, you can is the people that don't have as much. And I think because the enemy works in fear and fear says to you, you can't let it go. You just can't let it go. You just hang on to it. You need to stuff some under your mattress for a rainy day. You know, you need, and you do need to save and you need to do all those things, but you don't. Hoarding is not what God's calling us to do. He wants us to manage it wisely. We need to use it. We need to understand that, that wealth and money is nothing more than a tool for God's purpose. It's nothing more than a tool for God's purpose. If we would be obedient with that resource, with that tool, God could use it to win many, many people 
to the kingdom. If we would be uh, obedient and follow God's direction whenever we're talking about wealth, we wouldn't have to stand up here and, and ask you for a special offering to remodel the nursery. The money would be there. We wouldn't have to wonder how we're going to, you know, have outreach projects because the money, if we would just learn to hold it loosely, it's not, did you know it's not yours? Boy, some of you right now are saying, you don't, I work hard for that, it's mine. But the fact is, everything that you have belongs to the Father. You wouldn't have a job without the Father. You wouldn't have an income if Jesus didn't let you have an income. You wouldn't have a car to drive if God didn't say you're going to have a car to drive. God owns it all. And he says that we are to be managers, stewards. We're to be good stewards of what he's given us. It's all his. It's like he gives us all this, and he says, look, I'm going to give you all this. I'm going to give you this. Look, I'm giving this to you. You can have it. So all you need to do is just give me the first part. The first part. He didn't even ask for all of it. He says, I, if you, I just really want you to give the, the tithe. Now, this message wasn't even supposed to be about tithing, but here we go. Here we go. It's about, it's really, um, well, we, are, uh, we had a financial peace class here for the past uh, six or eight weeks. Man, it was awesome. Deb and I got to go to the last class. They all graduated. They went through the program. And I got to hear, hear Dave Ramsey speak on giving and tithing. And, it, you know, it was just so powerful and so strong. I thought, man, everybody in the church, we really need to hear this. And, it, and here's the deal. God's kingdom, God's kingdom work, doesn't need, God doesn't need your money. I'm just saying. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He doesn't need your money. I mean, do we really think that we're going to help God out by giving our money? Are we going to bail him out? Is he up there wringing his hands? Oh, my goodness, I don't know what I'm going to do about those people in Nigeria. Do, I mean, really, if we think about it, we have to understand that we're not, we're not helping God out. It's like that little old lady that used to be in a church that I pastored a long time ago. I'd come to church every week, and she'd say, Boy, Pastor, you're lucky that I'm here. I think, yeah, lucky, lucky. God doesn't need us to do that. God doesn't need us to give. Why do you think he commands us to manage what we have wisely? It's for us to grow. For us to grow. You know, we, we hang on to that paycheck, don't we? You know, Dave Ramsey said this, you've got to live like no other now so that you can live like no other later. I thought it was awesome, Right? We need to live like no other, no other people live now so that we can live like no other people live later. And, and I want to say that I'm not telling you today that if you start tithing and you put God first in that area of finance, that you're going to have more food than you ever know what to do with or your car. I'm not, I, you know, I can't, I'm not a name it, claim it, prosperity preacher kind of guy. Because I still believe that God is sovereign. I believe that God will give you, he will bless you. Any way that he wants to. And you know what? If he doesn't give you a million dollars in your bank account, that's okay. It's his money. It's his money. It's, listen to me, it's his money. Now, would you all say that after me? It's his money. Does that money in your checking account belong to you? Whose money is it? God's money. God's money. How much of it does he say that you need to give back to him? 10%. We all know that. Obviously. Are we obeying that? See, that's the deal. That's the deal. You, you really want to invest in something that matters? Invest in something that will outlive you? He said, you rich people, man, I feel sorry for you. He said, you've put all of your investment, all of your time, all of your toiling, all of your blood, sweat, tears into the bank account, and you've taken that, and instead of investing it in an eternal purpose, You've chosen to spend it on yourselves, and you're fat and happy, but guess what? The end is near. Jesus Christ is coming back, and he is going to want to know from all of his children, from everyone that put their faith and trust in him for their eternal soul, what did you do with your treasure? What did you do with it? So I just want to say, don't hoard it, but manage it wisely, don't increase it deceitfully like the guy that said, you know, like James said, that you have workers that work for you and you didn't pay them so that you could have it yourself. Instead, distribute it honestly. 
Pay people that you owe. Be a debtor to no one, the Bible says. We don't need to owe anyone, but we need to pay the people that we owe. We need to manage it wisely. We need to increase it honestly. We need to, to spend it. Don't spend it selfishly, but share it generously. Don't spend it selfishly. What? What? Just saying. It's not rocket science. It's scripture. It's right straightforward. James says, here it is. You want to be blessed? You want to be, ble- you want to be blessed? Do this. Don't spend it selfishly, but share it generously. The Bible says in Luke 12, 15, then he said to them, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist of the abundance of his possessions. Amen or oh me? Come on. So we're going to take the book of James, so practical, so life-giving, and we're going to take his strategy for investment, and he's saying, don't waste that money on yourself, spend it on someone else. And you're saying, I don't know how to do that, I, 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 I don't have the faith to do that. I'm simply saying to you, if you trusted Jesus Christ with your soul, trust him with your checkbook. If God said that if you give it away, if you share it with someone else, that you'll be blessed, try that on for size. If God said that you're supposed to give him the first 10% before you do anything else, then don't be disobedient. See what it feels like to live in God's blessing. See what it feels like to live in in God's purpose and in his will. We want God to bless us financially, but we live in disobedience. And it's kind of like, you know, our kids saying, you know what, give me a place to live and take care of my food and I don't want a spanking and all that stuff, but I'm just going to live my own way. I'm going to do my own thing, and then they want our, they expect our, and it doesn't work that way, does it? Our Heavenly Father is saying, you got, here's, a, here's the pattern for your life. Here's the pattern for investment. Follow that. Okay. Right? Thanks, Brother Gene. <laughs> so the Bible says, one man gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, but comes to a poverty. A generous man will prosper, and he who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. The book of Proverbs. So it's a challenge. It's a, it's a command by God. If you want to be blessed, then, then learn to hold things loosely. Hold things loosely. God has called you to the privilege of management of his resources. And he is saying, I am giving this, and this needs to flow through you. You should be a conduit to bless others and do a kingdom work. You should be a conduit to bless others and do a kingdom. I'm going to let this flow through. And by the way, you can hang on to 90% of that. You can hang on to most of it. I just want the first part. I want you to learn to be generous, and that's what he's saying. You need to learn to be generous and not spend it on yourself, not be focused on here and now, because the time is coming when Jesus is coming back. And he's going to want to know how you lived. You know, there's the the parable of the talents. And the Bible says that one guy was given five talents and one guy was given ten talents and one guy was given one. And, and the Bible, uh, the, the master said, go and invest these, go use these. And the guy that had the one went and buried it. And everybody else went and invested theirs and they did r- real well. And the master came back and he was going to take an accounting of what they did with his resources. And the guy that had the ten said, look, I invested it and I earned you more. And he said, That's a great job. Great job. Man, you've been obedient with this. I'm going to give you more. right? I'm going to pile it on you. I'm going to give you more than you know what to do with. Second guy, he had five, and he invested, and he came back, and he gave him more. And the master said, man, that's awesome. Here's more. Here's more. And the guy that had the one that buried it and was worried, and he came back to the master, and he said, I knew that you were tough, and I knew that I was, you know, I was a little worried about what to do with it, and you gave me the one, and I, wanted to, and I buried it so I wouldn't lose it. And he said, wicked servant. Man. See, God takes this whole thing of kingdom building seriously. He thinks it's the most important uh, agenda that we have on the books is building the kingdom. And I'm not saying that God will hold it against you if you're wealthy. God will not. God will bless you. God can bless you as long as you understand that that wealth is a tool. As long as you understand that that wealth does not control you, but you control it. Now, how do I know if I'm in control? How do you feel about giving God the first part of it? How do you feel about giving God the first part of it? That's a pretty good test. 
That's a litmus test. I mean, that's, that's basic entry-level Christianity. Test it. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm sorry I didn't catch any slack today. Don't blame it on me. Blame it on James, okay? It's his fault. He's tough. But he's true. Scripture is true. And I wouldn't be a good pastor. I wouldn't be a good leader if I didn't tell you the truth. I love you too much. I do. I love you too much to not let you know about the Bible's teaching on money, what the Bible says about it. It's pretty clear here, right? Don't spend it on yourself. Don't hoard it. Manage it wisely. Don't, don't use illegal means to get it, to hoard it. It's not good. Then, then James goes on to talk to us about the second part of an investment strategy. Number one, understand that your money is a tool. Your money is a tool for the kingdom. Use it for a kingdom, be obedient with it, and God will bless you. The second thing that he wants us to know is that it's actions that make life work. And listen to what he says. Be patient then. So almost in contrast to what he taught us in the first part. He said, be patient then, brothers, until the Lord's coming. So he says, it's coming. He said, don't forget about the fact that he's coming. Don't lose sight of the fact that he's coming. Don't, uh, don't get caught up in the world doing your thing and not realize that there will be a day when Jesus comes back and he's going to take an account of the way that we lived our life. He said, be patient, brothers, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop and how patient he is for the autumn and spring rains. You too. Be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against each other, brothers, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we consider blessed those who have persevered. You're, you have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Above all, my brothers, don't swear, not by heaven, nor by earth, nor by anything else. Let your yes be yes, and your no, no, or you will be condemned. So let's talk about the actions, not only our finances, our treasure, but let's talk about our time and our talent. How do we invest those? Because, see, the things that we invest in now are going to store a, a treasure for us in eternity. And he says this. Number one, I think, that we need to take note of is that we need to be careful about the crop that we plant. He said, take notice of the farmer, right? The farmer is planting a valuable crop. What kind of a crop are you planting today? What kind of a crop are you planting? That needs to be what we ask ourselves. And what do we have to plant with? What are the seeds that we have? Well, we have our time and our talent. We can sow good deeds. We can be kind to one another. We can serve in ministry. We can help someone that can't help themselves. We can go out to a street corner and pray with somebody that may not have a home. We can do all kinds of things, and the Holy Spirit will reveal to you what you need to do if you'll simply yield yourself to him and say, this is what I want to be. I want to be a kingdom builder. I want to invest my time and my talent in things that really matter. God, I want you to open up avenues and opportunities for me to tell people who Jesus is. And so I'm scared to tell who, people, who Jesus is. Don't be. Somebody at some point took time out to tell you who Jesus was. And he said, listen, be a witness, right? Be a witness. We can sow salvation. And you can be a witness. And being a witness is really simple. You don't have to know all of the, the theology. You don't have to know all of the doctrine. All you have to know is the, this. Once I was blind and now I see. You have to have a story. You got a story? How did you come to Jesus? Well, just tell somebody else how you came to the Lord. What are you sowing? And he said, the thing about the farmer is this. He sows it, and he doesn't expect immediate change. He doesn't expect an immediate return. And so many times we get discouraged about kingdom work because, man, I'm sowing, and I want something to pop up now. We need to understand what delayed gratification is all about. You know, I, I've talked to you, and it's chronicled pretty well, that I'm horrible, horrible, I don't do it, uh, I don't work out at all. And I've told you this many times. Not only, and I think because I don't work out, I figure, well, I'm not taking care of myself anyway, just give me another slice of coconut pie, you know what I'm saying? 
And I think I realize what the problem is. It's because I haven't really understood this whole idea of delayed gratification. Like, like I, so, 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 I would like to tell you that, man, the Holy Spirit got a hold of me and said, Keith, you got to take care of yourself. We got a lot of work to do. Uh, you know, we're building kingdom. And, and I would love to tell you that that, man, that the Spirit got on me and I just submitted to God. And, and it was actually wasn't like that. It was my wife on the telephone with somebody else. <laughs> and she got off the telephone. She said, honey, guess what I gave you for Christmas? God fixed up for you for Christmas. I'm like, what? She said, I got you a personal trainer. <laughs> well, Merry Christmas to me, right? <laughs> Hot dog, I can't wait. <laughs> so he came over on Friday, right? And I'm telling you, it's a big old dude. I mean, he looks like he, looks like he could probably eat nails for breakfast. I mean, he's just... <laughs> <laughs> and so we worked out, man, I'm like... 30 minutes of body sculpting, that's what it was. And so I got through and went to get the shower, and I looked in the mirror, and I was like, that didn't sculpt nothing. <laughs> what? I mean, I looked, at, I looked in the mirror, and I was like, hey, Dad, what are you doing in there? You know, but it was awful. And it just, I just wanted to give up. Like, I didn't see any change. Nothing happened. And I think sometimes when we're, we're living our Christian walk, we forget that it's, it's not instant. We pray for things. As a matter of fact, the Bible says if you're praying for something and it doesn't happen, just keep praying. Keep knocking at the door. And, and the owner of the house at some point will get sick and tired of you knocking at the door. And he's going to come and give you what you want just to get you to shut up. And I think that too many times we get going in God's purpose and God's will. Man, we get fired up about Jesus. We're going to church. We're serving. We're doing, we're doing the thing. And stuff is not changing like we want it to. And we just throw in the towel. I won't say don't throw in the towel. It's a long process. We're working to eternity. We're working and we're giving ourselves to an eternal purpose. And so I just want to say that whoever's playing that guitar needs to stop for just a minute. <laughs> Amen, everybody said? Amen. Amen, we ain't through preaching yet. JR's already had a bad day. I hate to pile on, but come on. <laughs> I want to say to you, as you begin to invest your life, not only your treasure, but your time and your talent, be patient. Be patient. He says be patient. We should be patient with one another. We shouldn't complain with one another. We need to understand that we're all a work in progress. There are EGRs among us. I've explained this a million times. Y'all know what an EGR is. Extra grace required. And if you don't know who that person is, it might be you. <laughs> be patient with each other. Love each other. Love each other in the Lord. Not only that, but we need to continue pressing forward. Here's the thing that I know, and today we're going to ask for a time of commitment. We're going to ask you to commit to the Lord. We're going to ask you to commit to investing your life. That's what I'm going to ask you to do. That's where this is all leading. Now, I'm not going to send a piece of paper around and get you to sign your name and put, I will tithe from now on. I'm not going to do that. And all of you can just take a big, right? Well, not all of you. A lot of you. I mean, whatever. Some of you. But I'm going to ask you to make a commitment. And, and if you make that commitment today, I'll, I'll promise you this. When you make that commitment, you're going to put a big target on your chest. And the enemy is going to start firing at you. And he's going to even... Today, as you leave this place, the enemy will begin to give you all kinds of reasons not to follow through with your commitment. Not to follow through with what obviously the Holy Spirit is stirring in you right now. As we sit here and as we open the word together, the Holy Spirit is moving in this room. And he's working in people's hearts and he's changing things. And, and people maybe for the first time are saying, you know what? I've been investing my life in the wrong thing. I've been spending it on myself. I need to realize that this life, this material world is temporal and it doesn't last it and i really need to be investing in eternity some of you right now are dealing with that you're grappling with that and you're going to make a commitment at the end of this service and the minute you do you'll put a target on about this big and the enemy will start firing darts at you he'll start firing doubt at you he'll start giving you worry making you wonder how you're going to do that why you should do that that you don't have enough time to make that commitment and i want to tell you you need to press forward you need to press forward because we know with a surety and the rain comes that the crop will grow. We know this. 
And the Bible says, don't get tired of doing right. Don't get tired. Don't weary in well-doing. We need to continue doing what God has called us to do, not because it's a good idea, because it's God's idea. Not because we think that it's okay. It's God's deal. Man, I'm telling you, if I didn't believe in that, I would not be standing here today. If I didn't believe with everything that I am, that everything that we do can be used for a kingdom work, I'd be doing something else. If I didn't think that the church, God's church, Jesus' church, acting like the church, doing the church thing, could make a difference in our world, I would get into politics or something. I'd do something else. But this is what I know. Laws don't change people. Jesus changes people. This is what I know. I can't put my life in anything that is any more worthy than investing myself in the kingdom work serving Jesus Christ who defeated the grave. And he is coming back. Press forward. Be consistent. Be consistent. When the enemy starts giving you doubt and reasons not to follow through with your commitment, just put one foot in front of the other foot and be consistent in the Lord and you will grow and you will be stronger and you will be encouraged in him and you will make a difference. You'll be a world changer. I think about Daniel. Daniel was a guy that was, he's in the Old Testament. He's a, he was a Jew and he, they were in captivity uh, in Babylon and, and uh, he was part of the inner circle. He was one of the advisors to the king and and he was more godly than anyone else. And all of, the other, all of the other advisors to the king took note of Daniel, just how committed he was to his Lord. And they were really jealous of Daniel because he was being promoted through the ranks, and they didn't like that. And they went to the king and they said, uh, we need to issue a decree. Because they knew that the only way that they could bring any charge against Daniel was to get him... Uh, to, they couldn't get him to lie or be dishonest, so they were going to get the king to order a decree that no one in the kingdom could pray to anyone else but him. And they knew that Daniel wouldn't live by that, and they knew that he wouldn't. So the king issued the decree, and the government was against him. The people that he worked with were against him. All the people that were around him were praying to King Nebuchadnezzar, but the Bible says that Daniel went to his prayer room and he pointed his face toward Israel, toward Jerusalem, and he prayed every day. He prayed every day. And the Bible says that because he did that, that there was judgment that was brought against him, but it was an opportunity for the whole world, for the king and everybody in the kingdom to see that God was God. And I want to say to you, when you put on the target and you say, I'm going to make a new commitment to invest my life in a Jesus purpose, in a kingdom purpose, in something that will last, and you start to walk that direction, and that enemy starts firing darts at you and says, no, you can't do that. Your family looks at you and says, what kind of religious nut are you? Your work looks at you and says, you need off on Sundays. I want to say to you, look, just be consistent. Be consistent. Step forward in what you know. Serve Jesus. Be consistent. And God will bless you. Don't give in to the enemy. He'll try. Don't give in to him. Fight the good fight. And then I want to say this. We need to show compassion. If we're going to sow eternally, if we're going to invest in an eternal purpose, then we need to sow compassion. The Bible says that the Lord is full of compassion and mercy. That the Lord is full of compassion and mercy. And as we invest our life, we need to, we need to pattern our life after the Lord. And the Bible says he's full of compassion and mercy. And I'm glad for that because the Lord looked at me and said, man, that's a mess right there. But I love him. I love him. When I was 18 years old, I asked Jesus Christ to come into my heart. Come into my life. I put my faith and trust in him. And he had mercy and compassion and grace on me. And he came and he started living in my life. And now, when he looks at me, I'm still a mess. But he sees the blood of his son. He sees Jesus because he's living in me. And because of that, I need to be compelled to show compassion and grace and love to other people. 
because of that, whenever we see videos of people that are waving the towel around and yelling, serve, I need to do that out of compassion. I don't have to look very far, maybe just in my circle of influence, to know that there are people that are hurting and broken. And they need a touch from Jesus. They need someone to speak into their life and let them know that, guess what? Jesus knows all about your pain and your suffering and the things that you're going through, but he loves you anyway, and he'll fix it. I need to have compassion. I need to serve Jesus because, just like Nathan said, I love people. I need to serve because I love Jesus. We need to invest our life in something that's eternal. So how about it today? What will you do with your time and your talent and your treasure? God gave you currency to use. Currency works best when it's put in circulation. How will you circulate it?